Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Herbert. I'm Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and I'm very um, honored to welcome you today to our webinar, Can Housing Policy Create Connections and Build Community? Uh, I'll say a bit more about today's webinar in a second, but I also want to use this as an opportunity to uh, give a heads up for some of our future events. Uh, on October 1st, we're having another uh, uh, event that will be live at the Chan School of Public Health, but also virtual. When We Walk By, Forgotten Humanity, Broken Systems, and the Role We Can Play in Ending Homelessness in America, featuring Kev Kevin Adler, founder of Miracle Messages, a nonprofit that helps people experiencing homelessness, and uh, author, a co-author of a book, When We Walk By. So that is on October 1st, I believe at midday. And then on October 10th, we have an event legalizing mid-rise single-stair housing in Massachusetts. This is a report that we did in conjunction with the, the design firm UTL and the support from Boston Indicators. This will be a 10 a.m. event live at the Boston Foundation, but also broadcast, looking at the question of how single-stair and uh, egress requirements and building codes limit the opportunities for missing middle housing. And then on October 11th, we have our, our, our bi-weekly webinar, a research seminar series featuring, featuring Alexander von Hoppen from the Joint Center on his, I'm sorry, uh, Carlos Martin, Sophie Wedeen from the Joint Center on creating effective, comprehensive, and accessible home repair programs. And then on October 18th, Friday, we have um, Alexander von Hoppen on the role of public housing in a new social housing system. So a busy calendar that we have up for the next few weeks. So for today's event, uh, today's webinar, we're featuring Sam Pressler. Sam is a recent graduate of the Kennedy School, someone I got to know as a student here. He's also a research affiliate now at the Harvard Human Flourishing Program, where he studies issues of the intersection of civic life and social connection, and a practi practitioner fellow at uh, the University of Virginia's Karsh Institute of Democracy. Uh, Sam is the uh, lead author of a new book, a new report, Connective Tissue, Regenerated Connection Within Communities and Reimagining the Role of Policy. The, the Joint Center, uh, we, we view ourselves as looking at housing from many, many angles, and housing is of fundamental importance to people for a host of reasons. We focus a lot on the financial importance of home ownership, certainly in today's market with affordability for both renters and home buyers at record levels of unaffordability. And uh, people are spending more and more of their income on housing, which leaves less left over for everything else. Quality of housing is obviously important. It's important for health. It's important for whether the house is sustainable, whether it's contributing to climate change or helping to mitigate those effects. Uh, we started to look at more at the question of the design of housing with our work on the state of housing design last year and the work we're doing now with UTL on the single stair building codes. But one issue of housing that we've spent little time talking about is housing's role in terms of social connectedness. And so Sam's work here looking at the question of uh, connectedness of communities and the ways in which policy can help foster those connections, which are so important for well-functioning societies, uh, is really important. And while his, his book, which I highly recommend, uh, delves into a whole range of policy areas where government can take a role in fostering these social connections. An important piece is housing. So uh, I thought when Sam uh, shared this work with me, I thought it was a great opportunity for the Joint Center to delve into a conversation about this issue of policy and connect, building connective tissue. So um, we're going to have uh, Sam start off now by presenting a summary of his work, just a summary. So I, I highly recommend that everyone look at the full report. And then we'll come back when he's done and have a panel discussion with some folks working on the ground in this space. So, Sam, welcome. And I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Chris. And I uh, thank you to the Joint Center. Uh, Chris is truly as kind and caring and supportive as he comes off, off on Zoom. So uh, I just want to thank you guys for this opportunity. Um, yes, my name is Sam Pressler, uh, and I'm the author of the Connected Tissue uh, Policy Framework, which is really oriented around asking this big question, which is, what's the role of government in strengthening connection or social capital in communities? Um, and as I learned through this process, it turns out that that's a really big question. It took me longer than I thought, um, but I'm happy to share uh, a little bit of this with you today, particularly around the role of housing and neighborhood policies. Before we jump in, I think there's the, the kind of question of like, who the heck is this guy? Um, and I do want to start just by sharing kind of 
my story of community and how I landed at this uh, on this work. Um, so I grew up uh, where I call home is a place called Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, I'm a third generation member of that community. Um, my grandparents were founding members of many of the Jewish institutions in that community. And my extended family all still lives there. It's a place where I was deeply known uh, for, I would say, good ways and, and bad ways in some regards. Uh, I think my real lesson on community, though, was actually from an experience of accidentally creating one. Uh, when I was 20 years old in college, I started an organization called the Armed Services Arts Partnership, or ASAP, which is now the largest community arts organization in the country, serving veterans and their families. And there I got to see this kind of magical almost undefinable power uh, and potential of community when you bring people together around connection, trust, all the ways they show up for one another, both kind of predictable, unpredictable. And as I was kind of took that organization along and handed it off, I was able to get a fellowship as, as Chris mentioned at the Kennedy School and, and at Harvard Human Flourishing and really was trying to like answer this question of like, what was that magic that we experienced? What, what is that kind of essence of connection within community and civic life? And so I've been really orienting around this question of how do we connect or reconnect people to these relationships, communities, commitments that make our lives worth living. And one project that's emerged from that is this connective tissue policy framework. About early last year, I was finding myself brought into a lot of conversations with policymakers who were kind of recognizing this moment that we were in where the problem underneath so many of the problems in American life, whether it be a democratic backsliding, whether it be economic immobility, whether it be kind of health outcomes and deaths of despair, was this sense that like the social fabric, the, our civic fabric was weakening. And as you saw early last year, there became a number of policymakers who were motivated to take action to kind of strengthen the roots of communities. Um, you saw the Surgeon General put out his advisory on loneliness. You saw Senator Murphy do some work in Connecticut. But you also saw this gap where connection and social capital could feel really hard to kind of pin down. It could feel awfully squishy. And so there was a sense that the space went underdeveloped. The space was potentially a bit siloed. And policymakers didn't know where to begin. It's how you end up with some of these op-ed titles and then memes of the cure to male loneliness being retaken Constantinople. And so that's really where we came in with this policy framework. The goal was to provide policymakers with this principled, organized, actionable starting point for connection-focused policymaking. I think in the framework, I say like 10 times that it's a starting point, not an end point. And as you see, you'll see, it, it very much is that. But we felt that we needed to begin somewhere. And I want to start with like the principles. This is kind of, this will be the overview slide of the framework. And then we're going to get into the more housing and neighborhood focus of the work after that. So we thought it was important to ground it in what are the principles that kind of policy can approach strengthening connection and community. And we, we, we landed on three. The first was policy can increase civic opportunities. And what we mean by that is the supply side of social capital. So policy can help create more spaces for people to connect your, 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 your kind of civic infrastructure, your um, programs, your activities, your groups, where you can participate and build relationships. But policy can also do the second thing, which is increase participation. Make It can make things more participatory. It can remove barriers to participation. And policy can do a third thing, which is it can increase the connections that actually enable and result from participation. So this can be overall connections, and it also could be connections across a line of difference, like class or race or um, age and things along those lines. So once we establish those principles, we then needed to like figure out a way to kind of organize what could be a extremely broad breadth of potential entry points into something that is accessible. And so we structured into four complementary chapters, um, a chapter on foundational changes, a chapter on community institutions, a chapter on life transitions, and then one on enabling conditions. And each includes three to four uh, related sections. The final thing we did w is try to figure out how do we make this actionable? And, and the way we did that was separate each section by the specific level of government, um, local, state, and federal, and philanthropy that can take action, then within each of those levels, provide specific policy opportunities that people can uh, actually act on and complement those with examples, case studies of those things in the real world. And so for, days, for today's conversation, we're going to be focusing on the community institutions chapter and specifically our section on housing and neighborhoods. But as you can see here, the framework is both uh, broad and deep and, you know, 
as a follow-on, we encourage you to check out other components of it with the chapters and sections detailed here. So why focus on housing and neighborhoods and why am I like so energized by this section in particular? Uh, as, as Chris mentioned in the intro, I do believe we have a once in a generation opportunity here to kind of got, draw on the bipartisan momentum to boost housing supply and boost ho housing affordability and then convert that into uh, housing and neighborhoods into a platform for participation connection in our communities, both overall connectedness, but specifically across lines of difference. So how is this, like, why does this kind of matter? Why, why, why now? Uh, first, let's start with the kind of fundamentals that where we live, it fundamentally shapes our social reality. The places we frequent are dictated by where we live. So too are the groups we join, the neighbors we interact with, and the relationships we form. Um, and we're seeing this momentum around how middle housing policy, around social housing policy, and all of it has the potential to create these mixed income communities. But as Chris was mentioning, more supply does not equal um, more connection. More affordability doesn't equal more connection. We need to build connection into the very process as an outcome for how we think about housing and neighborhood policy on the front end, throughout, and on the back end through the activation of our neighborhoods. So what I'm going to get into in the next three slides is really the three different, I would say, categories that we thought about housing and neighborhood policy in terms of a play a role I'm going to talk about this at a fairly high level, so I definitely encourage you to check out the framework and dig into it further and obviously ask questions uh, in the Q&A. But I'm going to go through it briefly, and then we'll, we'll close and turn over the panel to actually talk about bringing these things to life. So the framework uh, really starts with uh, in the housing section with housing policies. And I want to talk about a few housing policies that do seem to have the potential to, both, to build more mixed income neighborhoods, and through that, more bridging connection. So middle housing, which many of you know, you know that is an opportunity to both reform zoning laws uh, that enable more diversity of housing within neighborhoods. And if successful, this can both boost the supply there, but also the potential for cross-class integration. Social housing is another angle where um, these kind of mixed income, publicly owned, democratically controlled and permanently affordable housing by building mixed income into their very nature, we're creating the conditions for potentially more cross-class interactions and more connectedness. The final one I'm talking about is co-housing, which is still very fringe in the US, but it's of all the options, it is the most communal in nature. Communalism is built into it. You know, you have shared activities, you have shared spaces, you have shared responsibilities. And to the extent that, you know, potentially philanthropy can make this more of a mainstream thing, it does have long-term potential in terms of uh, strengthening the connectedness of our communities through housing policy. But we know that, like we said, these housing policies alone are not enough. It's We need to figure out how do we bring people together through neighborhood programming and neighborhood activities. And I'll kind of speak through three different uh, opportunities we identified in here. This is not exhaustive. Um, but the first is thinking about how, as neighborhoods are changing, um, as people are moving in, uh, the one commonality among all people with children is that they are committed to the long-term well-being of their or with parents are committed to the long-term well-being of their children. And there's a real opportunity there to build in cohort-based programming for these parents in their neighborhood schools where they're attached to their the class or grade of their students. And they're actually coming together on a consistent basis, both to learn how to support their children, but also uh, to kind of support one another and connect with one another. Think about a club for parents that's not kind of voluntary like PTA, but it's actually a social club for parents to support their children tied to schools. The second thing we see programming wise is just the array of neighborhood programming that can activate communities and bring them to life. And there's a lots of examples of local governments providing micro grants and capacity support to do this. One of them is going to be on this panel later, um, as well as kind of community groups who are doing this type of work. So talking about block parties, barbecues and dinners, violence interruption programming, welcoming activities for newcomers, and different types of block improvement and block betterment activities that pro promote cooperation and connection. The final thing I want to highlight in this is not as explicitly programmatic, but more around the idea of civic opportunity, which is kind of what are, how do we build and create more communal micro spaces in neighborhoods, um, both through zoning reform and through funding for people to gather um, and come together. And so thinking about not just large parks or community gardens, but micro parks and gardens, small tool sharing workshops and 
and, and tool sheds where communities can come together, work on shared projects, and even enabling kind of micro pubs and cafes and third places that maybe are not in a downtown area, but in, in any community, you can kind of stumble into kind of a local third place that's accessible and affordable and connect with one another. The final kind of leg of the stool is really not just on the programming piece, but also the neighborhood level leadership and coordination piece. And here, uh, there are three related activities that we've seen uh, local governments and, and philanthropy kind of do well in certain places. The first is building neighborhood level leadership. And so kind of thinking about your block captains, your neighborhood liaisons who are residents of a community who are both interfacing with government and interfacing with their uh, neighbors to um, kind of offer this program and coordinate this program on a consistent basis, promote cooperation to better the block and advocate for the neighborhood's needs with local government. The second piece is, is related, but how do you shift? It's about shifting the activities from the government to the isolated individual to government to the neighborhood level. And so an example of what this looks like is, you know, instead of a government providing micro grants to individuals to plant trees, how do you provide grant money to neighborhood level leaders to make tree planting as more of a neighborly or a neighborhood effort? And the final piece here is, you know, as you're having more neighborhood level leadership, um, there's a real opportunity to promote peer learning, kind of improve the programming and promote connection within kind of neighborhood leaders. And so we're seeing this at the city level uh, with things like lo the Love Your Block program, where cities who are trying to do more of this are able to learn from one another and, and develop uh, their efforts around it, but also specifically an opportunity for communities of practice, specifically for these neighborhood level leaders both to connect with one another directly within their places and also connect with one another across place. And so as a zoom out, you know, this combination of, you know, housing policy to increase, increase mixed income uh, communities if successful, coupled with the activation of these communities has the potential to take this moment where we're really focused on supply and affordability and actually make it a moment where we can really promote overall connection and participation in communities, but particularly this kind of bridging or, or kind of cross-class, cross-race, cross-age type of connection within these communities. And so with that, I, I want to just close by thanking you um, and encouraging you just a few steps to get engaged further. Please do read the framework. As I said, it's a starting point, challenge it, build on it. You can do that at the connective tissue us um, share the framework with other interested policymakers, researchers, and practitioners. And please feel free to meet with me. You can go to that website there um, to email me directly or schedule a meeting directly and give me feedback, brainstorm with me on, you know, how do we take this and build on this further. So with that, I want to thank you and turn it over to Chris to get to the really exciting part, which is how does this actually look in practice? Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, and that you did a nice job of summarizing, which is a very comprehensive work. And so again, I'll recommend to our readers, our, our listeners, that you, you check out the, the work itself. Um, and introducing our panel, I just want to go back to the report itself and, and take a couple of quotes around the housing piece. And, and one of them is the quote that leads off the chapter that says, American neighborhoods can be places for participation, not withdrawal, connection, not isolation, bridging, not sorting. And to do that, we need more mixed income housing that can lead to more demographically diverse neighborhoods. We need more safe neighborhood spaces that can lead to more interaction between neighbors. And we need more neighborhood groups and programming that can lead to more participation and relationships among neighborhoods. So we need more housing, more spaces, and more efforts to bring people together. And I think uh, the panel that we have, let me introduce the panel. We have folks who are featured in uh, as examples in Sam's report. And those include uh, Natalie, uh, Natalia Benitez Perez, who's the director of the Mayor's Office of Civic Organizing for the City of Boston. So welcome, uh, Natalia. We have Jamil Martinez, the director of Neighbor Network Organizing for Lawrence Community Works. Um, welcome, Jamil. And we also have Alyssa Nichol, Senior Research Associate for the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. So those folks could please turn on your cameras and join us here. Um, and so what we have here in our panel is we have uh, more representation really, I, I think on the spaces in the programming side, although obviously Alyssa, your work in, in mixed income communities relates to the building of that housing, but I think more about once you have that housing, how do you make it a thriving community? Uh, there is a sense, I think, to all too often housing policy, the, the idea of building the housing is 
the beginning and the ending of the job, and it's not by any means. So what I'd like to do first is just to introduce our, have our panel go through, introduce themselves, your organization, the, 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 the history, a little bit overview of the mission of your organization, and then to talk about some examples that relate to what Sam's talking about here, about how we build these communities that function well. So let me start with you, Natalia, from the City of Boston. Welcome, and, and please introduce your organization and the work you've been doing. Thank you so much. I hope my internet is okay. It's, it keeps breaking off. Um, so my name is Natalia Benita Spraz. I live in the city of Boston. I am the director of the mayor's office of civic organizing. It's a small but mighty office that was created by Mayor Michelle Wu about three years ago with the understanding that we needed an office to be able to own uh, creating pilot programs and programming for residents to be able to be connected and have more support, breaking down barriers to be able to be active members in their communities. So things like we do, we support block parties all around the city with some funding, microfunding, micro grants, as well as uh, Love Your Block, which is a beautification effort that we do every year in the city of Boston to, to take care of our areas and have residents to meet with one another and get to know um, the neighborhood and take ownership of their own areas. So these are some of the things that we do. We've also um, launched the first civic summit. We put 200 civic leaders and upcoming civic leaders together in one space to really network, get to know each other and the work that everybody else does. So Basically, the mission of our office is to create the spaces and break down the barriers for people to really get to know one another and the amazing work that everybody does and get to know people at a more personable level. Great. Um, so let me let me turn to J Jamil Martinez. Do you want to introduce yourself and, and um, your organization? Sure. Hi, I'm Jamil Martinez. Um, I work at Lawrence Community Works as a director of network organizing. Lawrence Community Works is in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, it's a community development corporation that works with residents and other stakeholders. We provide affordable housing, training for academic and educational success. Um, we also do leadership trainings to develop um, our residents politically and socially. Um, and one of the things that we utilize is the neighbor circles. Neighbor circles is part of our organize, network organizing um, that helps us build social capital. It's fundamental to the approach that LCW has, um, because it's not just about housing and progress. We have to build relationships um, and because that is critical for the community success when we are working together, when they are kind of, uh, working all together. Neighbor circles um, currently in the city of Lyons, we can host four to six a year. Um, it is three dinners. The consecutive dinners with um, the residents that open up their doors, um, neighbor circles, brings people to conversations um, so they can decide whether or not what's working in their neighborhood and what's not working. Um, taking into consideration that right now the city of Lawrence has a very high population of undocumented families. Um, many of these families are struggling to navigate familiar landscape here um, and so I think neighbor circles have become very effective in the neighborhoods because it helps build relationships and families and neighbors start working together. You know, just to put a, a fine point on this it's you, know, you think about these neighborhoods as you mentioned that immigrant families people come in you know this and um and over time they may have deep roots but many people come in they're they're newer to the community uh, as you say they came from other countries um, they they may not know their neighbors. They're busy. They're taking the kids to school. They're working many multiple jobs, right? And so they don't know each other, surprisingly, in some sense. But if we think about the way life is organized. And so you make those connections, knock on doors, you get people to come together and have dinners and create that neighborliness that we take for granted coming from, you know, normal interactions. But, but the way our lives are structured today, we don't have those normal interactions. Is that a fair description? That is, yeah. And one of the things that we normally do for our first dinner is that we do something called the map exercise, where there is a map of the world and people get to, with a marker, highlight where they came from and their journey here. Some people even discover that they're family, but that bring, that builds relationships and neighbors get to know each other on a deeper level. It is right. easier to open up that conversation after that of what are the needs, what are the wants, what are the challenges that they're facing within their own neighborhoods. 
And it's not dissimilar from what Natalia, the block party concept, right? Where you have people who are living in the same block and, and, you know, they may pass each other each day, but when you have that money, it doesn't take a lot of money, but you give them that money to have that barbecue, have that close the street off um, and start to make those connections. And I think we take for granted that those will happen organically, um, but it's kind of like a plant. You got you to gotta put it in good soil and give it some watering in order to, to make those roots start to grow. Yes, I totally agree with that. Um... It is super important to build those connections, not only neighbor to neighbor, but also neighbors to their city officials, neighbors to the police department, who is making the decisions, the government decisions within the city, and how strong is your voice? Um, that is super important in our neighbor circle conversations. Great. All right, let me, Alyssa, let me get you in the conversation. Um, tell us a bit about uh, the National Initiative on Mixed Income Housing and, uh, and some examples of the work you're doing in this space. Yeah, thank you. I'm Alyssa Nickel. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, it's really great to be part of this conversation. I feel like I'll just essentially be highlighting the things that you all are saying about why we're in the room together. So as you can tell from our title, the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities, we really started. Um, this is our 10th anniversary year. I'm really thinking about where we've come. The center started 10 years ago, but really built upon a prior 10 years of research. So this um, mixed income housing policies, as you said, started uh, back in the 80s and 90s and really recognizing that, that was, those are housing policies. But we came to the work recognizing that those policies really, um, if we think about why we find them important, it's really because of this history of segregation and exclusion and marginalization of communities. So how can ho housing policy mixed income, this idea of mixed, really if the intent is to bring people uh, bring people back together and be have people in one space, really changing the narrative of of this country and how we are uh, building one another. So um, we really wanted to, with this center, create a space that was gonna connect people and gather the best information and knowledge that was out there about mixed income communities um, and how people are implementing these policies, do our own basic research, evaluate and advise. Um, and yeah, I think we've, we've recognized the bright spots that some of us have talked about already, it really works in terms of building buildings. Physical transformations have happened. Neighborhoods have been revitalized, if we want to use that language in some ways. But really what we're seeing is there's really a failure in those pieces which relate to people, um, social cohesion, um, economic mobility and shared and equity around um, wealth and health and all of those things. So our work right now is really is really saying we want to be people focused. We want to um, get in there. And uh, right now, for example, we do impact research, we do consulting, network building. And part of that will be um, uh, really digging into spaces that are uh, mixed income communities and asking, do, do we have a shared uh, vision? Bringing all of the actors to the table and say, can we have shared vision? Do we have one? How are we operationalizing that, each of us in our own spaces? Are we really um, helping to create micro practices, I could say, in some communities? Definitely in Cleveland, we're diving in and saying, can we help with um, building uh, 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 leadership in blocks and, and ways for people to really connect with one another. So I think we're really aligned um, with this group in thinking that what's important is uplifting those ways of being that connect us to our shared vision. And then I think what we really want to think about is what is that shared vision? Um, what are we trying to overcome? And we have some ideas about that, but yeah. And Alyssa, let me, just for our audience, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, my understanding of the history of your initiative really springs from um, redevelopment of public housing, beginning with Hope Six and through Choice Neighborhoods and others, and as well as other initiatives, but that took uh, older subsidized housing that was heavily concentrated among very poor folks, was redeveloped into what was uh, deemed to be a better community to be mixed income. And so the idea was we didn't want to concentrate poverty. But the reason why your organization has to exist is because 
there's this um, maybe a little bit of a Pollyannish view of saying, oh, you know, of course we don't want to concentrate the poor, so we're going to have mixed income and it'll be a better community. <laughs> and then lo and behold, it's like, what does that mean uh, to be mixed income? And the fact that people are coming into these communities with different resources, with different degrees of power, and then we have to think about how do we design design the housing to bring to people together in an equitable way? And how do we think about the program that exists within that, that housing that allows what you're doing, you're describing of the creation of a shared vision and a shared vision of, and actions that we bring it together. Is that a fair summary of kind of the, the place that, that your organization comes into? Yes, absolutely. In fact, how I came to the organization, I've been with CASE for um, a couple years now with NIMC. But prior to that, I was in San Francisco. So I was working with a nonprofit really looking um, at the what was called the revitalization, public housing revitalization initiative in San Francisco. So that was um, the Hope Six projects there coming out of now it was past Hope Six, Hope, Hope, Hope SF, and really kind of thinking about, um, yes, what are, how are people designing these communities? Who's involved in designing those communities? And really seeing that unless that's, pay, unless we pay attention to that at the beginning, um, really we don't even have the infrastructure, um, the places where people can be together. We don't have places for people to really understand where is power shifting in these spaces? How is this making a difference? So yes, really coming out of those spaces of uh, revitalizing, revitalizing public housing spaces, and then recognizing that there are lots of places where we're really thinking about um, how are we connecting communities and in some ways, I don't know if we yeah. want to say integrating them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I what I uh, what I know about Hope SF, and, and again, I don't want to be you know mis misinterpreting this, but I think it really is a good example of Sam's framework, right? And this housing framework, he says, first we got to create these mixed income communities, and then we have to create safe spaces for people to come together. And then we also have the supports for that coming together to be meaningful and, and productive. And so taking housing as an example, so you Hope SF, other examples of, of, of recreating housing as mixed income, you have to have the spaces then where people come together in a way that's that's productive. And so if you have um, community gardens, if you have common spaces that are accessible, if you have athletic facilities and other facilities, as opposed to say a doggy spa, <laughs> which is not gonna be equitable. So, and then you have to have those spaces, then you have to have the programming. So I mean, is that a, the directionality of your work in terms of thinking about the spaces and the programming that go along with them? Yeah, definitely in spaces that are already under construction, we wanna make sure that those are there. And it's really this, not just the spaces themselves, but the intentionality around activating those spaces mm -hmm. and who is kind of leading that work. Um, but also I might say for the develop the newer developments um, that haven't even started, kind of going back to the design of the of that. Who is participating in designing the spaces? Like right now, it seems like at the beginning, it's very developer heavy. And we're wondering what if artists were at the beginning of the design? What if residents were at the beginning? What if youth were at the beginning? Because the way that spaces are designed. Um, can create these natural places of of uh, of interacting, and then the work is to activate that and be intentional. But the design itself, from the very beginning, could be shifting. All right, I want to bring other folks in the conversation here. So I want to think about one of the questions I saw that came through the Q and A. And if you send those questions in, we may not be able to address them all, but we'll try to get to them as we go along. Was the question of of what kind of metrics are folks looking at, both to kind of understand where you need to intervene or or to to, to put your attentions, and how do you know whether you're successful? Jamil, I might start with you. Um, I know Lawrence Community Works, this the neighbor circles. You've been doing those for a long time, and so um, what's your experience in terms of thinking about metrics to say here's where we need to be involved, and also how do we know if we've been successful? Um. Neighbor circles, so a lot of people are asking us to host neighbor circles. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have as many organizers as OCW would love to have. Um, they're successful when you realize that the neighbors are coming together, even just to say hi to each other. Neighbors weren't talking to each other before. 
and now they are. A simple hi builds relationship. Um, and so neighbors are starting to talk to each other. They're starting to talk about the safety that's happening, talk about the cleanup, talk about affordable housing. Who can we go talk to at the city level because the rents are too high? Um, what projects are coming out that we could be part of those conversations? Um, a lot of them are talking about parking within the streets, but they're working together to do all of that. They're going together to City Hall to raise their voices and, and, and speak on it. You know, they come together for three nights of dinners and conversations, but then they meet as follow-up meetings themselves, and we come in as support, as facilitators, and we let them lead um, the conversations. They join larger campaigns with us. We talk about voter registration, right now the rent control in, in Massachusetts because the rent is so high. Um, it's For us, it is successful as long as we're building those relationships and they are understanding that they can create change within the community. So I take it that, so you're, you're seeing success in part is that as, as these connections grow, the activity and participation in Sandstorm becomes more organic too. That is it, that when you prime the pump, you can you get them. It's not just dinners. It becomes, you know, other activities to, to lobby local government for improvements and services and the like. Yeah. And they participate. They create their own barbecues for the whole neighborhood. They ask us, hey, where can we get donations? And we just help facilitate those conversations um, so that they understand what they need to get done instead of us doing it for them. Right. Because we're and in and we're out to different neighborhoods. And Natalia, what about you in the city of Boston? Do you folks have metrics or outcomes or things you're looking at? Absolutely. So our cabinet is extremely uh, connected uh, to the various neighborhoods in the city. We have liaisons that represent each neighborhood. So we always have uh, people out and about uh, listening to, you know, uh, sentiment analysis, almost like, how do we feel about this? new initiative, this pilot program. But for us specifically, it's the number of participants that we, we receive every time we launch a new project or initiative, um, as well as a demographic diversity. Are we reaching all of the neighborhoods? Are we only reaching five out of the 23? So these are the metrics that we really like to see when we are planning and at the end of each pilot program, we go back into the beginning and let's see what are the metrics that we got where do we have to do more work and how we can get to the residents that we really want to get to. So for example, the first year of the block party um, program, which was last year, it was our first year ever, we had uh, $30,000 that we could spend in grants of $750 per person. The first year we found it a little bit harder to get to communities of color and migrant communities because of the how difficult it is to navigate the city in terms of permitting and what do you need and there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of uh it's not a very welcoming um atmosphere if you're not if you if your first language is in english for example or if you're a working parent who doesn't really have time so we took the time from last summer to this summer to really think about what are those permits that we should be pulling away? Do we really need this permit for this? Do we really need a permit for that? So we took a look at the permits, laxed them a little bit. So people didn't feel the need to have to apply to three different permits to be able to host a block party. So as of right now, if you're just doing a potluck style block party, you do not need any other permit besides the permit that allows you to close the street. And that permit, um, it takes you about 10 minutes to, to sign up and do it. It's very easy. We do info sessions all the time, show people how to do it. We don't require a nonprofit to be able to sponsor a resident to be able to throw a block party. We just pay the resident directly. So we really try to make it as easy as possible for the residents. And this is the second year now that we did it. Ended up being an, a huge success again. Um, and so much so that we are carrying this work over towards Halloween and October. So we had a $10,000 left in our budget and we're like, why don't we, you know, have micro grants again available for Halloween uh, and harvest celebrations so that residents can go out there safe and in community. And this is just something that we do not to force people to do anything, but to really incentivize a little bit that resident that would really, or has an idea of something, but perhaps don't have the means and, you know, to 
you know, just push a little bit. Like, let's do it. You have $750 you can spend. You can spend it on candy, music, whatever you want. Uh, that's going to, you know, allow you to have a good time with your neighbors. And it it has been a great um, program that we are going to definitely continue every year. Yeah, we've gotten a question about whether public spaces are overregulated. So, Natalia, you're touching upon that. What you're saying is that you have these permits that kind of help uh, pave the way. Um, it, it's an interesting uh, the ways in which bureaucracy can can inhibit community. So that's you know you're obviously addressing that as part of what you're doing. I, I want to get back to Alyssa. Alyssa, you're a, an academic research center, so I, I think when we talk about metrics and measures of success, it might be uh, something that's very much a, a part of the way you think about things. How are you folks thinking about metrics and measures of success? And you're on mute. We're rethinking a lot of it. So just to be honest, in terms of where they are, I wanted to uh, pick up on the last thing you said, though, are the public spaces overregulated? Um, there's a just to put a plug out there, there's someone who I follow on TikTok, he's called a, a happy urbanist, and he really talks about design in public spaces. And one of the things he was noticing was that um, our parks are uh, created in this way where um, it's almost like they're shaped so everyone's just watching the kids and really thinking about could even those spaces be designed in a way where adults are able to interact with their adults um, as adults and really make parks not just about like looking at kids, but really saying we're all here in a different space. So I just thought that was an innovative idea I wanted to throw out there in, in relationship to that. Yeah, we are really looking at metrics. You know, one of the things when we um, uh, wonder about how the roles that people are playing within these development spaces. Um, what is the relationship between the residents and the property managers and the developers and the planners? Are these really, um, can we find a way to wonder, are they working together? Um, are there, is there shared power in those spaces? Are ideas being um, brought forward and, and implemented? So there's some of those spaces really talking high level, I would really wonder, I'm just throwing some of these out there as ideas, I kind of wonder if we were to follow the money of development spaces from the top, um, how much are we um, putting in terms of our line items for developing the buildings at the beginning? Of course, we need that. But really, where is the money going in terms of these supports being given to communities to implement, to create, to ideate, to imagine uh, boldly around bringing people together? So I would definitely say, let's, let's follow the money a little bit. Um, really wondering where are these incremental growth strategies within policy? So if middle housing is, is something that we know is important, is there really opportunities for uh, minority uh, Black women-owned business enterprises to um, get those contracts? Peer procurement is a mark. Um, who, gets, uh, who gets to participate in um, the wealth that's being generated um, out of these developments. So wealth generation, economic mobility as something that's also a mark of social cohesion um, and also a mark of equity, right? So are those measures in there really wondering, are there policies that are um, thinking about outside investors my internet cable is unstable. Outside investors in these communities. So are there policies that are wondering about um, people buying up all of the this empty land in a community that takes it out of, um, that they're not participating in? Are people really... Um, you know, the Airbnbs and uh, people developing these rental housings, things like that really are also on this level that says the people who own the space and the land aren't the people who live there. So they're not necessarily going to be as invested in those intentional community uh, building um, areas and support. So those are just some kind of broad ideas that are on a different, yeah. You know, you mentioned um, you know, the, the idea that we, we we fund the development, do we fund the kind of services? And the answer is probably, and the short answer is no, is that when we, we have development funding and then the idea is you get 
funding for those kind of services elsewhere. I mean, I guess, uh, Jamil, in, in terms of your organization, in some respects, we've kind of outsourced this, right? And the fo folks like Lawrence Community Works are doing that community building work. Where do you get funding from? Who's supporting you in doing this work? Um, maybe I should leave that for Jess, but yes, we do. Um, as at least I was talking, I'm, you know, picturing all the conversations we're having with the community and how we bring their voices in. Because before we even, we purchase the building, but it's always, what does the community feel we need there? And so a mix of youth and adults of all ages, you know, what is their vision within the space? And we have really dynamic conversations about that. Once the property is built and, and families move in, we really take priority in making sure that we're building those relationships within the building to create community there. Um, we do a lot of engagement activities and they have a sense of ownership within that property. Um, they take care of it, they host potlucks all the time, cleanups, they arrange their own cleanup for the whole neighborhood around there, but that's just one building. It's beautiful to see. Yeah, so we do host a lot of community conversation prior to building anything. Um, and then after as well. Um, we've touched upon this already, but but um, one of the issues that I, I think that makes this work challenging is that you're, when you're dealing with marginalized communities, communities that are under stress from a variety of ways, and this this may be a, an optimistic uh, endeavor, right? To get folks who are struggling with lots of other areas and also feel very left out from society to get them engaged. I don't know. So Natalia, you touched upon this, but in terms of what are the kind of strategies and approaches you need to really deal and engage with more marginalized communities? So we rely heavily on our neighborhood liaisons. Um, these are individuals that are part of the community. They're appointed by the mayor and they are, a uh, majority of them have been activists in their own communities, have worked in the various nonprofits. So they know those neighborhoods front and back. They know every person that lives there. They know how the neighborhood um, operates. And for us, it's very important to have that knowledge because what works in one place does not work in the other. So we have to tailor uh, our outreach to that specific way. So does that look up? For example, sharing information at the local community centers, or if you have a health center, that's where we should be going with information versus the public library. So we are very intentional on where we are putting the information so that we can reach the people that we want to reach. And going back to um, Aly Alyssa's uh, conversation, one of the liaison's roles in the city of Boston is to oversee the community process for all the development that happens in the city. So this is really important because in the city of Boston, we have a very known community process that we follow for all development projects that require zoning um, variances. So part of that role is to convene a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood meeting with a developer uh, and really deep dive and explain what the, the new proposal is, how is this gonna affect the community and also how does the community feel about this new proposal? Is there anything that they wanna see? For example, we hear a lot of the times new trees. People want new trees because they want to have a you know a neighborhood that feels more homey and then it it feels better for the environment, etc. So, with that being said, having community voices always at the forefront of everything that we do is very important because at the end of the day, we are doing the work that we're doing to service the community and to service people. And Jamil, uh, you, you've touched upon this too, but other, obviously, Lawrence, you're dealing with a lot of folks who are marginalized. What are kind of lessons learned there you have for others? Um, I think we should be working together, all of us. Um, yeah. Touchback base. So I, I think that um, a lot of our donors, it's because they believe in our work. Um, and so that's how we get funding. <laughs> We've been able to not only say that we do something, we've been able to um, show the work that's being done within the community as a whole. Um, I believe in, in engagement. I believe in making sure people understand the power behind their voice. Um, and I think that LCW is doing a great job of leading that in the community um, and making sure that we are leading from behind and the residents are always up front. 
Um, you know, this is uh, Sam's work is really focused a lot on the public sector and trying, to, which I really appreciate. You know, we when Sam came out of the Kennedy School of Government. Um, there's a lot of folks come out of the Kennedy School of Government who don't necessarily have the faith in government that Sam does. <laughs> and I think the idea of putting the you know the the fact that the government has a, a, an important role to play here, front and center, is is really important work. Um, so, but uh, we have Natalia from the city. But but what recommendations do you have? And Natalia, this could be for governments at other levels. What the, what what recommendations would you have for government to help support and advance this kind of work of building social cohesion and social connections? I think the first thing is to always hire people from the community. I think that's the first thing because you cannot change the system if you're not part of the system. So that's my first thing. Uh, second is to really invest in things that feel attainable for regular people that work two jobs or parents. Things that are easy for them to apply for, that don't require too much oversight or fiscal sponsor or a ton of paperwork is to really remove the barriers of time. How much time is this um, application going to consume out of my afternoon. So everything that we do, we really try to think how much time is this resident going to take doing this? Because what I want them to spend time on is planning their event, inviting their neighbor, the neighbors, the, the nonprofits, talking to other people, not producing paperwork for me to read. So I think my advice to other cities and, and towns is to really think of of just making it easier for people. If you're doing a grant program, how is how can this be easier for folks? Not only to apply, but after they receive the money, how do they receive the money? Do they have to, you know, get a vendor ID? How how strenuous is the process to get a vendor ID? It's just to always make it easier. And there's always a little bit of budget left to be able to fund some micro grants. And for us, seven hundred and fifty dollars might not seem much. But for somebody in the community, that is something that they can really grab and like, okay, we'll support another business in the community. So now not only you're giving somebody the means to be able to get to know other people, but you're also supporting the small businesses within the community. So it's just making it easier for folks. So yeah, I would just I would underline that uh that connection to the small incremental, you know, we really are diving into um, Adrian Marie Brown's work around emergent strategies. And part of that is small is all, it's a reflection of things. And yet often you have to be polished in a certain way, going back to procurement, you have to be polished in a certain way to get any sort of contract and really wondering, is there enough capacity building for smaller agencies, smaller groups, even if it's not connected to, you know, a, a, a large nonprofit? What, ab what about the smaller community groups that are really doing exciting work um, with one another? And also really looking for amplifying the way people are already living, um, that are already working with one another. Um, I think the other thing I want to highlight about reaching out to different communities, it's any communities that we've been given feedback on with some of our research, we'll always, always ask, well, you've heard our questions. Um, what can we do with this research? And they'll, they'll usually we've been given the feedback of, can you just make sure you're talking to people, not just academics? Make sure what you're saying is said in a way that anyone can understand. Um, because oftentimes, uh, people in government will say, well, this is too complicated for you to understand. No, it's not. People can understand financing. People can understand, um, you know, how one thing is connected to another. So I think by really our responsibility is to say we can use story. We 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 know how to use social media. Let's use social media. Let's use story. Let's communicate. There's organizations. It's really around making a case for what you need. And I think uh, communication and putting some you know funding toward that is really really important for any organization and so, yeah so jamel i'll give you that question too and you know and what's uh how do you work with the city of Lowell, for example what are the you know what's the difference between what they do what you do and and how does that kind of break down the responsibilities work in your case 
With the city of Lawrence, one of the great things that we do is that we already build relationships with the city councils that are in office. And so we invite them into the neighbor circle so that they can also build relationships with the residents. The residents get to know them by name um, and start calling them directly. Um, start putting pressure wherever they feel is needed um, so that we're not doing that. The residents understand, they begin to understand who is making the decisions in the city? Where is the power? Um, and that is one of the greatest things that we do. We do that not only with the city councils, we do that with state reps, anyone that's willing to come and be part of those conversations instead of just being able to conversations. We're getting near the end, and Sam, I haven't I haven't pulled you into the conversation. You know, as uh, as as someone who was looking at this from a higher level, um, do you, what are your, some of your observations of the conversation we've been having with these folks? Um, what do you see as some of the key takeaways here? Yeah, I mean, I think I could I could name a few. I would say first, like all of this stuff is messy, and if it wasn't messy, uh, it we would have already figured it out. <laughs> um, and so I think you know part of the um, appeal of kind of the materialist kind of kind of sub focus on supply and focus on affordability pieces. Like if we can only hit these metrics or these outcomes, we'll be successful. And I think we should ask the question: It's like if we hit these outcomes and these metrics, will we be creating the conditions for flourishing communities? And my answer to that question is no. Um, and so I think that's why this matters is to engage with the messiness because the messiness is unavoidable if we're kind of trying to uh, create flourishing communities. I would say that's part one. I would say part two on this that I think is pretty clear that I'm hearing that I think is an important takeaway is like this is not, especially what we're talking about here, it's not like big government interfering with community. I think what Natalia is doing is creating the enabling conditions so that people can form those organic relationships. And I think the reason why the block parties is just an important thing to highlight is because it's fun. Like not everything needs to be about like advocacy and organizing and this like difficult stuff like that. Like people honestly don't come together around those things. Like what did Putnam find in making democracy work? The thing that predicted the strength of a democratic society in Italy was not voting or anything like that. It was how many choir groups were there in that place. And so like we need to think about this act of gathering in and of itself as an end in and of itself as something that's critical to um, kind of what makes a place work. Uh, and I'd say the third piece, and I'll stop after this, but this is me getting it all in pretty quickly, is from a time horizon perspective, I think it's worth contextualizing. We are in the very, very early innings of kind of a new wave of kind of community oriented thinking. Um, and I equate this kind of to the environmental movement where we took something that was in the background, which was like environmental outcomes, and we're moving them to the foreground as an end in and of itself. And that's what we're talking about. Social connection, social capital, collective efficacy, these types of measures. And so it is going to be messy because it is very early and because that is the nature of it. But if you essentially, if we believe that that is an end worth uh, working towards, it's it's worth kind of navigating the messiness and the complication and the difficulty. So well, that's great. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good summary, Sam. Um, to, to echo what you're saying too, is I, you know, I'm a housing, so-called housing expert. We have a housing crisis of multi-dimensions. <laughs> Um, and people say, well, what's the, the solution? And I think the hard thing is that there isn't a solution. And as human beings, we tend to grasp, we want a solution. And right now, for better or worse, we've grasped the idea we need more housing. And that, that's the big solution. The issue there is it's not wrong. <laughs> we do need more housing, but we also need more of certain types of housing. And we need more of certain types of housing in certain communities. And even if we do that, the work of the folks here in this panel is really important and underappreciated of how do we build that social connections? How do we make those communities thrive in communities? And it requires civic participation or wild social connectiveness, both because that strength leads to more activity to make those communities stronger and preserve those communities. And because in and of itself, it's what makes people have lot thriving lives. So, um, we're at time. I just really want to give my thanks to you, Sam, for initiating this conversation, to Jamil and Alyssa and Natalia for joining us today and for the work you do, uh, which is so important. So 
Um, there's a lot more in the in the report. There's a lot more each of these organizations have to share. I encourage folks watching today to to check out the City of Boston its work, the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities, and Lawrence Community Works, which is a, a really long-standing, highly respected community organization uh, that we have a lot to learn from. So thank you all. Please uh, check out their work, and I hope the conversation continues. Be well, everybody. Thank you.